A reading from the second book of Chronicles. In those days, all the princes of Judah, the priests and the people, added infidelity to infidelity, practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. Early and often did the Lord, the God of their fathers, send his messengers to them, for he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his warnings, and scoffed at his prophets, until the anger of the Lord against his people was so inflamed that there was no remedy. Their enemies burnt the house of God, tore down the walls of Jerusalem, set all its palaces afire, and destroyed all its precious objects. Those who escaped the sword were carried captive to Babylon, where they became servants of the king of the Chaldeans and his sons, until the kingdom of the Persians came to power. All this was to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Until the land has retrieved its lost Sabbaths, during all the time it lies waste, it shall have rest, while 70 years are fulfilled. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord inspired King Cyrus of Persia to issue this proclamation throughout his kingdom, both by word of mouth and in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me, and he has also charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever, therefore, among you belongs to any part of his people, let him go up, and may his God be with him. The word of the Lord.
I prize not Jerusalem as the first of my joy. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, God, who is rich in mercy because of the great love he had for us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, brought us to life with Christ. By grace you have been saved, raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you. It is the gift of God. It is not from works, so no one may boast. For we are his handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for the good works that God has prepared in advance, that we should live in them. The word of the Lord. Dominus Bobiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. Verbum Domini. In the 
midst of this penitential season of Lent, the church invites us, particularly today, to enter into and to experience joy. And today we celebrate Laetare Sunday, which means rejoice. And it comes from the very first word of our entrance antiphon for today's Mass, which begins, Rejoice, Jerusalem, and all who love her. Be joyful, all who are mourning over her. There is a joyful anticipation in the texts and the prayers of today's Mass in view of the upcoming Feast of our Lord's Resurrection in just three weeks. And the purple vestments that are usually worn during the Mass in Lent give way to rose vestments for this fourth Sunday of Lent. And joy is an effect of charity in our souls. As we grow in the virtue of charity, as we grow in our love for God and neighbor, joy is an interior fruit of that, of that charity, and as well as peace. And this is what our Lenten observances or practices should be doing. They should be helping us to grow in our charity, to grow in our love for God and neighbor. And that gives us joy. And the presence of joy strengthens us in our resolve to persevere in our Lenten observances, our Lenten practices, which we've made during this holy season. Our first reading today, however, does not begin on a joyful tone, but it does end on a note of hope, which brings joy. Our reading from Second Chronicles emphasizes the destructive nature of sin. It covers the decline and the exile of the people of Judah. The sins of God's chosen people led to the destruction of the temple and to their being taken into captivity by their enemies. We're told in today's reading that they added infidelity to infidelity practicing all the abominations of the nations and polluting the Lord's temple, which had been consecrated in Jerusalem. And more specifically, the reading mentions they're having, not, they're having failed to keep the Sabbath, not keeping the Sabbath. This was a sign of God's covenant. So profaning the Sabbath was breaking their covenant with God. And then when God sent out of love, sent his prophets to call his people to conversion, sending prophet after prophet after prophet, they rejected them. The prophets were met with mockery and persecution. And as a result, God humbled him, his people. He allowed the temple to be destroyed and the people to be taken into captivity in Babylon. And ultimately, even this exile, the destruction of the temple and the exile, was a call for them to repent, to turn back to him. As I mentioned, we do see, however, our first reading ending on a note of hope. It was under the reign of the Persian King Cyrus that a decree was given that proclaimed liberty for the captives and that the temple should be rebuilt. And this was a great cause of joy for the people. They would once again be able to go up to Jerusalem to worship God and his temple. So having read about the exile in our first reading, again, which we see as a clear result of their sin, their disobedience, our responsorial psalm today, which was Psalm 137, was one of the great psalms of lament, and its setting was during the Babylonian exile. When the Jewish captives wept over the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, and it mentioned specifically that they refused to sing psalms of joyful praise when requested by their captors. And even though it is a mournful lament, it's also filled with hope because they had a burning desire to return to Jerusalem one day. And so in a Christian view, this psalm reminds us that we also are like exiles in this earthly life, that heaven is our home. And just as the Jews had a burning desire to return to Jerusalem, we should have a fervent and burning desire to, re to go to heaven. That's our home, that's our true home, the heavenly Jerusalem. So may we never forget that heaven is our home. And in our gospel today, our Lord tells Nicodemus that just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This takes us back to the book of Numbers when the Israelites became impatient in the desert and they complained against God and complained against Moses. They said to Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. That worthless food was the manna that God had been providing them, that God sent from heaven, and they were sick of it. So in response, 
We're told from sacred scripture that God sent fiery serpents among the people, which bit them, and many of them died as a result of it. Then they went to Moses and repented. And so their suffering brought them to repentance, to conversion. And after praying for them, Moses was instructed to make a bronze serpent. And if anyone who had been bitten looked upon it, he would be cured and would live. And so if you look further at this healing, we see that the people had to look upon an image of what harmed them. In this case, it was a serpent, and then they would be healed. So looking at the image of the serpent being lifted up on a pole was a reminder of their disobedience, of their sin. This drew them to a deeper conversion, to repentance. And so likewise, our sinful humanity is being cured or healed by Christ, who is lifted up on the cross. And when we look upon Christ crucified, we see the effects of our sins. Our sins crucified him. Gazing upon the cross reminds us of the gravity of our sins. And it's also a symbol of hope, just as the bronze serpent being lifted up in the desert was a symbol of hope for the people. Christ lifted up on the cross is our hope. He redeemed us by his sacrifice on the cross, and he also transformed suffering. Now that Christ went through his suffering, he's transformed it. So now suffering has meaning, and it's powerful when we unite our sufferings to his on the cross. And so we're reminded as well not to let our suffering go wasted, but rather to offer it to the Lord. And additionally, when we look upon Christ on the cross, we see what love is. And that was particularly emphasized in the gospel today. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. So love is the key. It was out of love that God sent the prophets in the Old Testament to call his people back to him. It was out of love that God permitted his people even to be taken into captive, so that they might be led to conversion. And it was out of love that God had the temple rebuilt for the people to pray and to offer him worship. And ultimately, it was out of love that God gave his only son to save us. St. Augustine would say that we had to be persuaded how much God loved us in case, of, in case out of sheer despair, we lacked the courage to reach up to him. Also, we had to be shown what sort of people we are that he loves in case that we should take pride in our own worth and so bounce even further away from him and sink, sink even more under our own strength. It's a good balance to have, right? That when we're struggling, maybe perhaps um, under the weight of our own sin, even if we've been absolved, even if we've made a good confession, sometimes our past can haunt us or cause us, there can be a temptation to despair or distrust God and his mercy. We look at the cross and we see he loves us that much that he was willing to suffer and die the most cruel death for us. And St. Augustine has the balance too at the same time if we might be tend to be puffed up with our pride, to look what he suffered. He suffered, that's the cause from our sins. Our sins crucified him. So it's a way to keep us humble and to trust in him. So here in this Holy Mass, we get a very good look as well as, the, as for the love of God. We see the love that God has for us as our Lord is lifted up on the cross. He's lifted up in the Holy Eucharist as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He loves us so much that he feeds and nourishes our souls with his own body and blood in Holy Communion. And so as we continue celebrating this Laetare Sunday, may we foster joy in our hearts. As St. John Vianney would remind us, the only happiness that we have on earth is to love God and to know that God loves us. 